Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, what is Christian anarchism? If you have been following our project for any amount of time, then you know we focus on no king but Christ, and today is no different. I was introduced to our guest today by fellow podcaster Derek Creter from the Fourth Way Podcast, and after listening to Jay Newman for about five minutes, I knew I wanted to have a conversation with him. I think y'all are really going to enjoy this conversation. Right. We'd rather serve God as right. our Caesar, you know what I mean? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. Jay, how are you doing? What's up? Doing good. I uh, so just just for our listeners' uh, benefit, we we re- tried to record. We did actually record this. I don't know, maybe back in July or August, and I had the, the episode set to publish in September, and something happened with the audio, and we 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 still have not been able to figure it out. And I'm I'm grateful that you agreed to come back on. Let's try it again and see if we can make it work. Because I want our listeners to hear what you had to say about this topic, because I really enjoyed what you had to say about it. Both times I listened to you on Theology on the Raw and uh, the Fourth Way podcast. So I wanted to get you on the Bad Roman and let's talk about Christian anarchy. But before we do that, you're wearing a Philadelphia Eagle hat. (laughs) And I forgot that you're an Eagles fan and me being a Cowboy fan. And you mentioned that whenever we were messaging, trying to set this up again, you said, yeah, that'll work because the Eagles don't play that. So I was like, damn it. He's an Eagle fan. I forgot all about that. <laughs> and at the time, the first time we recorded football season hadn't started, you know, and I'm a, a, a died in the wool Cowboy fan and I can't stand the Eagles. Now, as much as it pains me to say this, the Eagles are having a fantastic year right now. They're undefeated at this point. Hopefully that doesn't last, and I, I know you're hoping for more wins. Um, before we get started on Christian Anarchy, and you, you told me before we started recording that you, and in messaging as well that you got into some Twitter conversations that sound very interesting to me that I'd like to touch on as well. But why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, whatever you want them to know about you, and we'll get into it. Um, you know, I never know really what to say. Um, I mean, I, right now I'm a barbecue pit master. Um, I worked in the music industry for most of my adult life, uh, promoting, um, managing that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, when everything shut down, there was no work for me. So I got into that. I've been doing that for the last two and a half years and it is pretty much what I do now. Um, place I work at got rated number one in Nashville. I enjoy the ethos behind, uh, sitting by a pit managing a fire all day and transforming meat into uh, beautiful, wonderful, glorious goodness. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm a reader and I'm a thinker. Um, I have a lot of friends who I guess I've gotten in the circle with um, some writers and podcasters who, you know, for whatever reason, we we have good conversations. And so I'm friends with people who have some, uh, have written some successful books and, uh, have some successful podcasts. And so I, I've gotten pulled in on some conversations on some different podcasts. And that's, that's how you, I guess you probably came across me. I tend to be a contrarian. My default is to doubt before I accept. Um, so I just want to test the ideas that are being put out there. And sometimes that leads me to some places that are uh, pretty counter mainstream which is why I'm on the Bad Roman podcast, because in particular, I guess my political views, <laughs> I, I'm sure you've encountered, and I guess your listeners uh, probably understand if they're into the Christian anarchy thing, that it, it's hard to get people to accept it at face value. Like it's, it's usually takes a series of conversations to get people to open up and uh, really even give your point of view uh, time to even listen to it. So um yeah, that's uh but that's my thing. I think it's important. I don't think it's the most important, but it seems to become increasingly important in our overly politicized uh culture and society that it just seems to there needs to be an option where people are like, "Hey, you don't have to pick any of these sides actually if you want to follow Jesus. You you can uh 
be done with all of it. Right. You know, really. And that's in some ways refreshing, but people really find that hard to accept or hard to believe for whatever reason, even though I think most people would love for it to be the case. <laughs> so, well, you know what I've noticed and it's not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's, it's on a grand scale by any means, but what I've noticed that the longer our project is gone, if you exclude the word anarchy and just call yourself a Christian and talk about how the early church behaved when it came to the Roman empire and how prior to Constantine, and you talk about how we're no King but Christ, we're Jesus centric. Yeah. If you talk about it in that manner, people will agree with you. And you throw in that, that word anarchism, it throws a wrench into the conversation, which I'm not completely opposed to because I like throwing wrenches into the conversation because I want them to understand what we're, exactly what we're talking about. You know, when you go read folks like Tertullian or Polycarp or, or Origen back in the day when they, when they were responding to the Romans, you know, and even Jesus himself, they weren't running around calling themselves anarchists. They just lived this life. They lived this life. They knew who their king was. They knew who Jesus was. They followed Jesus only. They didn't give any care to what the Roman Empire was doing, even though they were being persecuted constantly for not uh, calling Caesar their lord, not calling Caesar their king. You know, Polycarp said when they were getting ready to execute him, he said, I've served him for 86 years and he's done me no harm. Why would I blaspheme my king and savior now? And then they tried to burn him to death and that didn't consume him and they ended up stabbing him to death. That's the that's what we're trying to get Christians back to. Not saying we're we're seeking to be martyred by any means. That's not what I'm suggesting. But getting back to that mentality of no king but Christ. We know Jesus is our king. We don't need a Donald Trump. We don't need a Joe Biden. We don't need a Barack Obama or a George W. Bush. We don't need that. We already have a king. But what I've noticed in, in these conversations, if you just get down to that conversation with them and say, no king but Christ. We already have a king. They they will fall in line with that. But you throw in that word anarchy, and then something triggers in their brain that something Sean Hannity said or Donald Trump said about anarchism during the riots, which is garbage. That's not anarchy. You know what anarchy is. I know what anarchy is. It's 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 the way of not being ruled by another human being. I mean, even Jesus said, "You see how the Gentiles lord over one another. It will not be that. It will not be so among you." And we don't, I don't think Christians take that seriously enough. And that's what we're trying to get Christians back to with these conversations that we have on this show and in our project and our blog. And now this conversation with you, Jay, and I, I'm kind of curious, how, how did you get to that point? Because I'm listening to you on these other podcasts, you've always, you, you've been involved with voting and doing all this stuff, but you, something happened that you're like, hang on a second. I think I might be a Christian anarchist. Yeah. I mean, I reserve the right to still vote. I think I'm done with it, though. Um, I mean, I've I've always separated compartmentalized uh, politics from my faith. Like, I've never thought that they go together, which I'm grateful for, because that would have taken to me, I really think, some real more deconstructing. Um, and But fortunately, that wasn't ever something I had to really te tear apart. I mean, it just was always a separate thing. Part of it was because I have an international background. My mother's a Brazilian citizen. Half my family's Brazilian. So there's always like a sympathies for another country, you know, which always every time there's like a July 4th or any kind of very pro-America thing, you've also got someone who's very, I mean, I know, you know, we would also celebrate Brazil's Independence Day, which is pretty weird when you're living in Arkansas, you know? So, um, but, um, so, I mean, I, I think understanding that there were more uh, states, more governments, uh, countries than just the one I was living in. Um, I've got I've got uh, some first cousins who uh, uh, grown up in France. My mom's brother married a French woman. They are French. They are thoroughly French. Um, and so you know you grow up with them. We uh, that side of a family was pretty close knit. So it wasn't like a total world away. But you're just like you know there are some sympathies and loyalties beyond just America. So that helped I think just having a more cosmopolitan background, upbringing. I think also my parents were also, my dad's a Baptist pastor. They both have their um, MDivs. They both have Masters of Divinity. So they've studied theology on, I guess, a, a graduate level. And both of them kind of were just like appalled by the merger of politics and the the, the Christian coalitions. And, the you know, they believed in voting, but like, when I was a child in the 80s and they were in the thick of these movements and stuff, 
there was nothing that was like glorified about it in my household. Like my parents were just like these, just more like eye roll. They didn't talk bad about them. They're just more like eye roll. Like this is ridiculous. So my parents always said, we're not Republicans or Democrats. We vote for the person that we think God wants us to. And sometimes that's one party. Sometimes it's another. We're not loyal to a party. So that's kind of always been my background. So, so that's that's like my baseline, right? So that's my beginning point. I think that's good. If you're going to have a baseline, it's a pretty good one. So I'm grateful for that. But, you know, 18, uh, time to vote for president. I voted for George Bush. I thought he had a good platform. 9-11 happens. His platform is totally upended. I felt like I was lied to. Even though you're a little sympathetic, but then now, you know, you got the Patriot Act. You got all, you know, we're going to war in Iraq claiming weapons of mass destruction. I don't, I don't have to relitigate all that, but everyone knows. But it was like I felt deceived. So the next um, one, I, which would have been, what, 2004, I went all in on Arkansas's former governor, Mike Huckabee. I was like, he's been a great governor. I'm going to support him. And of course, he didn't win the nomination, but it's still pretty big on me, like understanding what politics does to a person because I mean, he changed like drastically. He went more about party platform and, you know, more, he's more Republican than Christian now, it seems like, you know? And I'm just like, it's just appalling because I supported him. He was a pastor. He seemed compassionate. He didn't seem like party lines cared too much about him. But then he runs for president. Fox News gives him a show and he sold out, right? That's what it seemed like to me. And I know people who worked for him who said, yes, he did indeed sell out. So fast forward four more years. We'll just do it by presidential election cycles because that seems to be like the biggest uh, pressure points. Uh, Ron Paul, 2008. I think I probably don't have to go into much detail here, but I was all in. I was all in. And then 2012, when he should have won. And the Republican Party totally just changed the rules at the convention to keep him because he was getting hundreds of thousands of people at his rallies. Mitt Romney couldn't get like a thousand. There's no way. And I was just like, that's when you realize this whole damn thing's rigged, you know? And then uh, 2016, you know, there's no other word trying to stay away from four letter words, but what a shit show. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, just, you know, and it's just like, and that got me to the point where, so this is, so, all right, all that, that was a lot, but you know, that was probably 30 something years worth in about less than five minutes. But this is where it led to Christian anarchy. Cause it was, I was sympathetic to libertarianism because I was like, smallest government possible is best for the church is best for the kingdom, you know, because we have our own authority that we we live by the authority of the spirit. We don't need the state telling us what to do. But then 2016 happens, and then evangelical Christians get blamed for every sin that Donald Trump's ever committed, which I don't think is fair. Um, but it posed the question to me from an ethical standpoint, are you morally culpable for who you vote for? Because everyone seems to be talking in such a way that suggest the expectation is yes, that you bear a moral culpability for who you vote for. And so that's why people are trying to sanitize these candidates because they feel a certain responsibility for their image or who they are. So they can't be objective or honest about them. They can't be balanced because it's like, no. So there is this sense. Now, I'm not willing to die on the hill that says you are for sure morally culpable for who you vote for. But it seems like our society accepts that is mostly true. The way we talk to each other across the political aisle seems like you're at fault. You're to blame for this candidate, right? And you're sorry, you liked a few of his policies, but don't like the others. No, you're not allowed that nuance, right? You are responsible for the evil they commit. Okay, let's say that's true. Who can you vote for with a moral uh, purity? There's no one, right? There's no one who doesn't commit atrocities. There's no one not sending drones. There's no one not committing war crimes. There's no one who is not manipulating the system to help those who are already well off and hurt those who are already oppressed. There's no one who is consistent with the mission of Jesus 
who is a political candidate. So if that's true, you cannot vote and be faithful to Jesus. Amen. So it's a big if for me. I'm just saying, if you're willing to, if you say that, the other thing has to be true from my perspective. Now, if we can somehow nuance it and be at a place where it's like, well, I think he'll be better than this guy. But really, when you get down to it, what power is there in voting anyway? They limit your options. They make two sides of the same coin. It's like this, this whole thing's been manipulated. And it just seems like the only real change that'll ever happen is just to say, we don't need y'all. You know, like, I think Christians should stop being a voting block. And then you'd stop, if if all Christians said, we're not a voting block because we don't vote anymore, you know what would happen? Politicians would stop talking about God. Politicians would stop quoting scripture because the only reason they do it is to appeal to a voter block. Yep. They want to get that Christian vote, that evangelical Christian vote, the Catholic Christian vote, whatever. They want to get that vote. If we would say, no, as a tenet of our faith, we don't vote then they would stop pretending like they cared about what we care about because they don't care. So that's kind of where I'm at with it now. And that is in line with what has been called Christian anarchy. I've had to explain it to people like, hey, I didn't invent this term. It may not be the perfect term, but it's an ideology that's been around for at least a few hundred years now. And, um, you know, that's just what it's called. It makes sense when you break down the parts. I know anarchy has developed a meaning for a lot of people that is not what Christian anarchy is, right? And um, I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast doesn't need that to be explained. But but that's how I got where I'm at. No, it was great. And I, you, you said some things, two or three things I want to touch on. You said at the very beginning of that, you reserve the right to vote. And it was something I tried to, I was going to, I tried to pin you down on last time when we tried to record, when we recorded, didn't come through. And I want to try and pin you down again. Because I heard you mention you're toying with the idea was is voting actually a sin. I know where I stand on this on this topic. I've come to the conclusion that yes, I, I believe it is a sin if we're going to take the scripture of First Samuel eight seriously. Now, if, if in whenever whenever he's when he t- when Samuel was up, he, he said Samuel was distressed about it, and God's like, they didn't reject you; they rejected me. They're rejecting me as their king. They're they're asking for another king. And if, if rejection of God is not a sin, then I don't know what a sin is anymore. Okay, now, this is where I'm at. And, this, and th- th- when, I, when I say this to folks, people think, take it as I'm judging them on their, their understanding of this stuff. That's not what's happening. What's happening is this is the conclusion I've come to with this. I believe it is a sin. I no longer participate. I haven't voted since 2016. I will never vote again. But the long since 2016, and now it's 2022, the longer this has gone, I i wasn't like that dogmatic about it in the beginning, but now I am that dogmatic about it. The longer this has gone, the longer, the more I've read about the early church and how they responded to the Roman Empire. I mean, if you ever wrote, read anything from Tertullian, that guy was on point and did not care what the Romans thought about him. He was very outspoken against the Roman Empire. He said, we, we have no interest in the, the affairs of the state because it's completely foreign to us. Fast forward to 2022, it's not foreign to the Christian anymore. They're so in bed with the state. I mean, almost worse than ever, right? It seems like a faction has gone the other way with their logical conclusions, um, which I think is good only in the sense that it's exposing what's been hidden. And I think it's showing the ugliness of it. It's like, oh, when you play this out, you're like, oh, no, you know? And I, I want to get into this in a minute, but I mean, I had a guy defending the Crusades uh, because you got to protect Christendom from the Muslims. <laughs> and I'm like, what? what gospel are you reading, man? Anyway, um, yeah, so let's talk about the voting thing for just a second. And obviously, that's that's where I lose people. And that was kind of the buzz thing when I was on the Theology in the Raw podcast, which has gotten a lot, a lot of interaction, a lot of feedback from that, like a tremendous amount. And that's the part where people are like, eh, I'm not sure, you know? And I think what you said maybe probably agrees with this, but I'm no one's judge. I don't know your heart. Right. I don't know what your intentions are. And so I'm not going to judge that. And I think the sin comes from those intentions. Right. I think there is theoretically a way to participate in the voting process and not corrupt yourself. 
I think you can with a morally clean conscience. I, I'm interested to know how that's possible. <laughs> I think most people don't, but I think you can just be detached from it. You know, I just think you can say, hey, I am a, a citizen here in a way. And so I want to be a good citizen, right? Which Paul encourages us to be good citizens, right? Play the game as much as you can. Smooth things over, you know. Um, I, I think about Daniel, uh, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the way they were in exile. Like, you, It's not just like total removal from the processes of the system, right? They involve themselves in the machinations of the state to a point. There was a point where both of them were, they, Nebuchadnezzar tried to kill them. One got thrown in a lion's den, three got thrown in a fire, you know, because there was a point where they said no. But I think like having a say is not in itself wrong. It depends on why you want to have that say. Well, hang on a second, because and I, I see where you're going with this and I, and I agree to an extent. But what, what I'm talking about, we're going to have very loud opinions on the state as Christians. And we should. If we're not saying anything about what the empire is doing to our fellow man, to our neighbor, and even our enemy, we should be speaking out loud about it. I'm not saying re- remove ourselves from it to the, to the extent we're not saying anything about it. We should be the loudest ones out there because we, we understand what the state is capable of. Yeah, no, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, yes. So let, let's take that as a understood. That living your life in the polis, if you will, in the society, means that you're going to have some influence. And I hope the church does have such influence, right? Right. I'm specifically talking about the political influence. I think that there is a limited, and I'm, I, I, I'm, at, I'm of the mind that I want nothing to do with it. So let me be clear. I'm just trying to give some space for people who say to me, well, I feel like this is what God has called me to. Well, who am I to say? And it's going to probably corrupt you. But if it doesn't, you know, it's not the worst thing to have a voice for the church in the halls of the state. It doesn't have to be bad. It probably will go bad. Historically, it typically goes bad. I don't know why you'd want to even risk it. But I'm just not going to make an absolute about it. You see what I'm saying? Well, see, no, I know, I know, I know exactly what you're saying because I used to be that absolute about it, and I've gotten away from it because it turns people off to point. Because they're, like I said, I've reached a point now in my understanding in my life. This is how I see things, right? Then me trying to get people to do that and grab them by their shirt collar and say, "Listen, this is the way you should be doing it because it should be no king but Christ." It does not work that way. People have to figure this stuff out on their own, right? Just like I figured this stuff out on my I'm not saying when I'm talking to a fellow Christian that is still involved or engaged with the state or entangled with it and saying we need to get more Christians involved with politics or in the political realm to make the politi- pol- make the, the state better. I know where they're coming from because I was there. Me trying to, to choke them out and saying you're doing it all wrong. We, we already have a king. He's already set the example. It doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't set well with them. There's no middle ground, right? Like you're not going to have a conversation. You're just pushing them away instead of bringing them into where we can find some sort of middle like, points of agreement. Right. So what I'm doing now is if when we have these conversations, I'm saying this is where I'm at. Right. And no one can say anything about that because that's your conviction. Right. Right. And so, and I, but like I said, I used to be p- pretty hardcore about it because I was I would get so frustrated. Because I see things, a lot of things, the vast majority of things that I view are in black and white. I don't see a lot of gray in a lot of areas. And I know that's maybe a fault of mine. My mom has told me over and over that I was born that way. I've been that like way since I was born. So I don't know that it's something I can change. But I had to take, take a step back at one point and say, hang on. All right, Craig, chill out for a second. Hear them out. Let them talk. And then you say what you have to say about where you're at. And then you walk, then you can walk away from the conversation. Let that resonate in their mind. It's something we saw Jesus doing all the time in scripture was he never really directly answered any of these questions when they were trying to trap him, but he would return and ask them questions. And then they would walk away because they didn't have the answers. So they would have, it would be marinating their brain and you planted a seed. I, that's, that's kind of the, that's really kind of the approach that I'm taking now. 
I'm going to get on here and I'm going to say what I have to say because I really firmly believe that what I believe in this is right, that I think following no king but Jesus is the way to go. I, I believe that's our best route. But I can't force people into believing that because when you start trying to force people into something, they're going to be turned off. They're going to run away from you. Then you've lost them. And they're just calling you a lunatic. This guy's lost his mind. Well, but then they also become more uh, entrenched right. in their own ideology instead of coming towards the, the middle. And they're not taking any steps towards the place you think is better. You know, they're moving the opposite direction because they're like, well, you know, there is more outright rejection. So we're not going to get anywhere with that attitude. And that's why I said just when you're saying you're presenting it, this is my core conviction. Well, what does that do? That makes people go, oh, that's interesting. Why? Yeah. What led you to this? And you've got to be willing to say, if someone says, I feel like it is my conviction that the Lord wants me involved in the political system, you got to be like, okay, possibly, you know, I mean, I'm not going to reject that out of hand. Whereas, you know, a part of me would want to say it's impossible. <laughs> it's blasphemy, yeah. you know, whatever. But it's like, I mean, God's grace is so wide. I, I'm just I'm just not in any place to tell other people how to walk out their faith. I think there are parameters where it is no longer the same thing, for sure. You know, the creeds and the doctrines we have that kind of are guide rails for us. But, you know, how you live that out, like, in a lot of ways, it's not, it's not our business for each other. You know what I mean? And I think that God wants a variety of types and kinds in, in his kingdom and in his church. So I, I'm not sitting here trying to change everyone, you know? I think a lot of my problem comes from a, a place of frustration because what we see happening, and it's something else we've kind of talked about a little bit now is with like Christians in politics and getting more Christians and, you know, voted in and stuff. This has been going on since, let's just start with the founding of America. And it has progressively gotten worse. If we're getting, I mean, there was a, a poll taken. I don't remember what year it's been. It's been a while now, but there was like 80 something percent of the folks that were in Congress were professing Christians. If that's the case, then maybe getting more Christians involved with politics is making it worse because well, it's not getting better because if, if look at where we're at right now, considering the founding of America to 2022 and look where we're at now. It, we got Joe Biden as our president. And before that, we had Donald Trump as our president. This is have you seen the movie Idiocracy? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It is a documentary at this point. I know. It, is a, it has turned into a complete reality show here. And Bill and, Maher has somehow become a, <laughs> a prophet. I don't yes. know. Like I just I used like, to stand that guy. I used to not stand him. I know. And I heard him on the Joe Rogan podcast. I heard him on that. Did you listen to that when I heard him on that? I was like, this guy is making sense to me now. Bill Maher is making all kinds of sense these days. <laughs> where is, where is the world coming to? I, I totally agree. I don't I want to live here anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. Of all people, Russell Brand is like the sage who is telling the truth. I'm like, <laughs> you're talking about that guy who is in Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Like, <laughs> raunchy, filthy movie, like, is now, like, a light for truth. Uh, what? <laughs> I, what, what, what bizarro world are we in now? Yeah, I know. There's a lot of... <laughs> and But the thing about that is, and this is what I've said when... I said this in 2016 when Trump was elected. I said, the good that's going to come from this is that you're not going to be able... It, things are going to get exposed. I think I said that earlier, but, like, People's hands are going to be forced. So people who were going to church for a cult cultural kind of Christianity that was kind of blended in a way, but it's like wheats and tares. Like Trump's presidency became the separating factor in the church. You see who's in it for a cultural American type of Christianity, and you see who's in it for an eternal kingdom living in exile type of Christianity. Right. Right. You're seeing that. Right. And that commingled all this time. But like now you got, OK, First Baptist Dallas is writing hymns to make America great again. You're like, <laughs> what? How do you get to that point? Right. And so you're seeing this dividing line. And I think that's a good thing in the end. Right. But in the meantime, we've got um, people outright. I mean, I remember being in college um, studying theology and like the idea of nationalism was one of the sins of Israel. They thought they were so much the chosen one that they other nations were not chosen 
And so part of the reason that they failed was because they were nationalist. You know, part of the reason that the Messiah had to come was because they were so nationalist. And it was never, uh, they were supposed to give of themselves on behalf of the nations, right? So, and now we got people advocating, repeating Israel's folly. They're using the Old Testament, citing the passages that Israel failed and saying that's what we should do as a as Americans. And I'm like, no, this is wrong. This has been rebuked. This is and but now they're like like it used to be kind of whispered, maybe, but now I mean you got the book come out, Christian nationalism, um, where people you've got people outright saying, I am a Christian nationalist, which uh, even a year ago, no one would publicly declare that, you know. But it's gotten to the point where it's like, okay, everybody's cards are coming on the table now, you know, which ultimately I'd rather know where you stand. But the debate is happening in Christian circles. And that's where the Christian Twitter, weird Christian Twitter, they call it or whatever. Yeah. And that's why I get in. I wait in. Sometimes I just observe. But it's bizarre the lengths that people are willing to go. Like, I can't believe it. I want to I want to touch on on your, your Twitter encounters that you told me about in, in just a minute. There's a couple more things I want to touch on real quick before we get to that. A while ago when you were talking, you said something about being culpable for the, the guy you voted for, the gal you voted for. Yeah. This is another another spot where I'm like, OK, yes, I think you are responsible for that and you should be held accountable for it. Because you put that person in power who is destroying Yemeni children, who's in charge of killing millions of people. You know, the, I, I've had Scott Horton on the show a couple of times, and he, he mentioned once he said America has killed a holocaust of people, maybe more. And I, and I wonder sometimes if Christians to take, don't take a t- step back and say, hang on, I voted for George W. Bush. I voted for Bush, like, as you, like you did. You know, I've had to repent of a lot of this stuff, right? So. And people who voted for Donald Trump, who they said, well, he didn't start any new wars. I said, but he didn't he didn't stop any of them either. And he continued the the stuff going on in Yemen. The, the, the Yemen is a really soft spot for me because when you, listening to Scott Horton and the stuff, he talks about what's going on in Yemen. And these five year old babies are dying of cholera because we are supporting the Saudis in bombing their hospitals and their water facilities. They can't get clean drinking water, can't get the, the, need, the, the medical attention they need because we're destroying all this. Right. I think that maybe we should take responsibility for putting these folks in power who are responsible for that. Well, I'm with listen, I'm with you. I, I'm just not willing to make that judgment that you definitely are culpable. But who would you so let me ask you who who would you say is the biggest enemy of America? What nation would you say is the big right now? America or the American people? No, the United States, the state. Who do you think that they would consider like who hates us the most? Who's the biggest threat? Hang on, the United States government or the or the American people? Because I think there's two different things going on here. Because to me, to me, the biggest threat to the United States, the people who live in the United States, the biggest threat to us is the American government. Okay. Now, as far as it, it, what other country, well, it depends on who you're talking to. Some people say China. Now they're saying Russia. You know, and some people say Iran. Some people say North Korea. Right. But I mean. It's it's whoever it's who it's whoever whatever goblin they want to put up there to keep you distracted from what you're doing. You want to know the statistics of where the church is growing at the fastest rate: Iran, <laughs> China, Russia. You, you see, so you start to see that the interests of the state are absolutely opposed to the interest of the kingdom. The church is thriving in these areas against persecution and yet we consider them the biggest enemies of our state so that ought to lead us to a disconnect of our loyalties are you loyal to the place where the church is thriving and growing or are you loyal to protecting us from whatever the ends of the state are against that state because they they seem that they're never more at odds than you see the church growing and you see the state sanctioning this nation, which is making it harder for the people of that country that we ought to be supporting. So I think these lines need to be clear. It needs to be more that we need to put a highlighter on these things so that people are forced to say, well, which choose now who you will serve. Right. That's I've never really thought about that, too. You know, when you said that the, where the, the church is growing the most in those countries and 
now they seem to be the enemies of the United States government. That's interesting. That's a, that's a really interesting point that I've never even looked into. But it makes sense if you if you get down to it and start thinking about it. Anything that the United States government says, or any government for that matter, when they say something, I don't believe anything they're saying anyway. So when they're saying that these folks are my enemies, I've never met them. It reminds me like Muhammad Ali when he refused to go to war, you know, and he said, I'm, I'm not going to go fight your war. I've never met that person. Right. Why would I go over there and fight your war? And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm at that point. I don't believe it. Not only, though, do we have a neutral stance, like where I don't have a problem with them. We have brothers and sisters who are worshiping Christ with us that are in those countries. That that it should be not just neutral. It should be no. We're pro them. We're for yeah. them. We have more kinship with them than you. You know, because we have been brought into Christ's kingdom by His blood and by the embodiment and empowerment of His Spirit that binds us across national borders to be one. We confess that. We believe that. And we have more of a bond with them than we do simply because of your red and blue duopoly. Right. That, this, yeah, <laughs> this is true. All right. One more thing I want to touch on that I want to get to your Twitter in- interactions. You said something about when they when people say about paying taxes and Jesus said to pay taxes. And you said that, and I've always believed this. Well, I say, I say always. I started looking at it the same way that you you have mentioned it when I heard you talk about it was. I think he was just being a snark yeah. because they were trying to trap him. And I believe that he, I, I, I agree. I think that Jesus was being snarky to believe that Jesus didn't have a sense of humor. And if we're created in God's image, why wouldn't, when we have, well, not everybody has a sense of humor, so I don't know, <laughs> but I have to assume that God has a sense of humor as well. And Jesus had a sense of humor and he was being snarky. And it, it, we we're going to say that Jesus was an anarchist. If you well, if you come across any anarchist today, they're all snarky. Anarchists are pretty snarky anyway. So I have to assume that Jesus was snarky when he said, <laughs> OK, you know, like, it, and like you, you mentioned in that one episode on Theology and the Raw, talking about Seinfeld. Every time he got ready to tell a joke, he had that little kind of side smile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine Jesus having that side smile when he was coming back with this? And I, I agree with you because I've, I've said that when when you say, when I say Jesus was just being snarky, they're like, he wasn't being snarky. I was like, he absolutely was being snarky because you're t- trying to compare Caesar to God himself. I mean, you could go to- well, they had a good trap, right? They thought they had a good trap. They're like, well, and the scripture says this, it's like, well, if he says Caesar, then the people are going to rise up against him. Yeah. And if he says God, then the Romans are going to rise up against him. Yeah. But instead, in this very snarky way, he knew he got him, right? He had to have. He's like, oh, I got a good one. <laughs> you know? And he's just like, well, why don't you give to Caesar what Caesar's? It's his picture on there after all. <laughs> you know? I mean, must be his, right? And give God's what's God's. Yeah. And then everyone goes. Well, everything's God's, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. You decide. <laughs> yeah, you tell me. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> I love that too, because I've always I've believed that for the longest time that Jesus was a snark and he was being snarky in that interaction with those folks who they were trying to trap him. And sometimes it's the best way that I've noticed in my interactions with folks who want to argue just to kind of be a snark and you know, I was like, I don't know, you tell me. Yeah. It's just like you tell me. Let's look at it on both sides here. Now you now you decide. Yeah. Give to Caesar what Caesar's give to God what's God's. Pick a lane. And what 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 belongs to God? Right. Uh, well, I guess everything. Okay. Then I, I guess you really need to ask ask me that question. Then you just answered it for yourself. Exactly. I mean, and that's what Jesus was great at. He made you answer yeah. the question. This is why he answered questions with questions. I, we actually um we did family Bible study this morning, and we actually looked at that that section of scripture. So it was, it was I'm fresh on my mind, but yeah, I, I think very much that Jesus was not saying you have a spiritual obligation to pay your taxes. <laughs> I do think that you should pay your taxes because I think that it doesn't matter. Like just let go and be a good citizen because 
That's what's good for the gospel. Oh, I pay my taxes, but I'm going to uh, spit and cuss the whole way doing it, too, because I'm not happy about it. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's like trust God for provision. And, um, you know, Paul talks about as much as you can be a good citizen. You know, it's just not worth rocking the boat. And I think Jesus was kind of saying the same thing. I'm pretty sure that the drachma he pulled out of the fish, that he gave it to the tax man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just like, it's whatever. Like, but I think he was also making the point that he pulled it out of the mouth of a fish, which is like, I can get money anywhere. I ain't worried about money. <laughs> yeah. Like money is the least of my concerns. I made everything. Yeah. I ain't worried about that. And I think we need to adopt that attitude because we do make so many decisions out of fear of lack of resources, lack of funds, lack of finances. And I think the, the real lesson for me in that is don't worry about the money. When you need the money, he'll give it to you, you know, and if you trust him and if you quit trying to rearrange your life around how you're going to game the system or whatever, you know, just like, just don't worry about it. Yeah. Like trust him. He'll provide. If you radically believe that, then you don't base your life around financial uh, security, you know, so you, you base your life on faithfulness to Christ and let him worry about the money. Let him worry about the resources. And if the state tries to take a cut, you think he didn't see that coming? He'll take care of it. Yeah. He'll figure it out. And yeah. I, I think that's more the lesson out of it is like, don't worry about it. But as far as our relationship to the state, I think Jesus was very passive aggressive and dismissive in that passage towards the state. I mean, it's just like, I, I can't get my head around how people try to make Jesus as some sort of statist. I can't get my head around it. Like, there's no way... I don't get the argument. Like there are there are good arguments that I disagree with, but I can acknowledge they're good arguments. I can't even come up with an argument for him being pro state. The state killed him. Well, you go back to you, yeah, and you go back to his, the temptation of Christ and Satan offering him these the, to rule over the kingdoms of this world, and he said no. He didn't had no interest in it. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna assume that Jesus was a socialist or a statist or whatever. And go back to the temptation of Christ and see what he said to Satan himself when Satan was offering him to rule over the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus, no, I'm good. I know. That was available to him from the hand of the devil. And he did not deny the fact that Satan had that authority to offer the power over the kingdoms of this world. And if, if Christians would look at that seriously and say, oh, if Satan or if the kingdoms of this world are backed by Satan and his demons, why would a Christian want to be involved with them then? That's a good question. <laughs> Why? Because if you, if you, it's right there in scripture. That's a good question. And I've not got a sufficient answer from anybody. But they, they, they gloss over that, that conversation for some reason. I don't understand why it's right there. If we're going to take it seriously, why aren't we taking that one? There, there's so many things. And I think I'm guilty of it as well. Glossing over scripture. Then I come back and I see something differently. Now, when I see it in scripture, I'm like, why, how did I miss this before? But to me, that the temptation of Christ is so black and white, it's so right there in your face that you can't gloss over it. If you're going to gloss over it, it's because you don't want to see it and you're too entangled with the state as a Christian and you don't want to get untangled from it. Oh, that's the thing. People don't want, yeah, they, they don't want that exposed, but we're now in a time where it's being exposed. Hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, and send us an email at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. This is what I want to do. I want to read you conversations I've had on Twitter, all right? And you jump in with me. You say you're not on Twitter, so I'm going to drag you into Twitter here. All right, so this guy, who is a pastor in Boulder, Colorado, is a pastor shepherding people and he went to denver seminary 
where one of my best friends is professor of New Testament. I respect that institution quite a bit. So I'm like, how, what? Okay, anyway, this guy says, stop trying to fight, find the right hills to die on and start taking hills for Christ. And so I'm like, taking hills for Christ. I mean, that's military terminology, right? To take the hill. Uh Anyway, so my response was, taking hills for Christ means losing. It means letting your enemies kill you because you know you win in the long run. We win by losing, not by conquering. And he says, dude, please stop talking like this. You're harming our witness. (laughs) I'm like, I think I paraphrased Jesus himself there. And so I said, stop talking like Jesus. And he says, you're talking like the devil who tempted Jesus to throw himself off the temple to gain the world. And I said, I think you're conflating two different temptations. However, I'm doing neither of them. I'm echoing the words from the Gospels. He says, uh, you've been reading too much evangelical pop theology. (laughs) Return to our Protestant fathers. Scott Sauls, Russell Moore, and David French ruined the godly aspirations of righteous men. I said, yeah, dude, that's not what I'm reading. <laughs> and uh, I said, I've read Hauerwas and Brueggemann, and maybe you should try Jacques Ellul yeah. if you're open at all. And he gives me a gif of Bill Murray saying, no, thank you. And he's, uh, I give him the Ron Swanson, you sound like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> And then he retreats into this. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. And I said, dude, man, the only thing I've been honored for is my barbecue. But you're a fool because you're an Aggie, not for Christ's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Texas A&M alum. (laughs) And uh, anyway, yada, yada, yada. And I said, he's saying that he's just disagreeing with me. I said, you don't even know what I think. You never bothered getting that far. He says, you believe taking hills for Christ means losing. It means letting your enemies kill you because, and I said, I disagreed. And I said, did you ever hear about that time Jesus took a hill? He died on it. He let his enemies kill him. And so I'll just, I'll just skip forward in the convo here. Uh, I said, there's nothing for you to disagree with. That is the model of Christ. He said, you sound like you read the Bible like a fundamentalist pacifist. And I said, what is that? (laughs) I don't think pacifists are fundamentalists. (laughs) And and I said, but anyway, yes, the purpose of the rule of Christ is to bring shalom, a.k.a. peace, a.k.a. pacifism to the world. It's the opposite of taking hills, which invokes imagery of military activity. Nothing could be more opposed to the mission of Christ than the military. Now we're getting into what I think. He says, why did Paul use military metaphors? Why is Jesus coming back with a sword? Was God wrong in the Old Testament when he commanded Joshua's military? Was Jesus wrong to tell his disciples to carry swords? And I said, there's a biblical explanation for each of the things you said, but I'm limited by the character restriction. I'm interested in what you're saying. Are you literally trying to say we conquered nations for Christ with military activity? And he says, no. And I'm like, and I said, whew. So I'm like, all right, well, at least he's not advocating outright military activity, right? Well, then I get into this thing. It even gets crazier, man. This guy who doesn't even have his real name, his Twitter name is Sarpedon, King of Lycia, who, if you remember from the Iliad, is one of the kings who fought the Trojan War. He was supposed to be a son of Zeus. And I'm like, What's this about? And you go to his profile, it says he's a Catholic. Um, I'm responding to a guy I know I've interacted with quite a bit, who I think is a pretty sharp guy. He says, certain Christians seem nervous about what would happen if another kind of Christian wielded political power. This is an odd form of anxiety, given that they don't seem nervous about infidels, pagans, and outright demons wielding political power. And I said, I'd rather the pagans have the political power because at least they can be honest about it. The state is antithetical to God's kingdom. Now, notice they say nation. I say state. Right. Because those aren't the same thing. Right. Right. I mean, I don't know what sports team you cheer for, but they almost all are a nation. Right. We have Razorback Nation. Bleeding Green Nation is the Eagles blog I read. You know, there's a lot of different ways to constitute a nation. But we're talking specifically about the state. Um. I said, the 
the state is antithetical to God's kingdom. Any form of Christianity that tries to wield political power would have to balance the constant uneasy tension of their inherent hypocrisy. So this guy, Sarpedon, king of Lycia, says, I think you need to take a good look at the book of Psalms. You'll find song after song about how every nation on earth will bow before God. Notice I said state, he said nation. I said, I think you need to take an exegesis course or go back to 12th century where you belong. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'm being a little snarky. You talk about being snarky, I'm being snarky. And he said, go back to a century where people in society were infinitely far more Christian than they are today. Okay. And I'm like, oh my gosh, is he serious? And then he says, libertarianism is not Christianity. I said, I know libertarianism is not Christianity. No political system is. That's the effing point. <laughs> All states are anti-Christ, even the ones run by Christians. And no, the Crusades were not infinitely more Christian. They weren't Christian at all, except in blasphemous use of the name. And I thought this would be the point, like the other guys as well, I can't defend the Crusades. He says, this is the world we live in, Craig. He says, you shut your mouth. Those men died to try to help Christians in the Holy Land from Muslim persecution. No surprise you think that's bad since you have no problem with secularists making our lives a living hell. <laughs> and I'm sitting back here and I give the gif where I said, wow, defending the Crusades, huh? And I did the gif where I said, that's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. <laughs> you know, from Dodgeball. Yeah, you see that movie? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> and then he doubles down. Only atheists and Muslims have a problem with the Crusades. Which one are you? I'm, are you serious? Like, I'm like, that's not true. First of all, almost every Christian I know is ashamed of the Crusades. Am I, is he gaslighting me? Am I wrong? <laughs> like, what? All right. So there's two different people that you're talking about here. I want to go back to the first one. You said the guy was a pastor, right? Right. And he suggested you read some folks and you suggested he read some folks, right? Sure. I yeah. would recommend him reading early church writings prior to Constantine when he said you're advocating for fundamentalist pacifism, which doesn't make any sense. Those two, those two words shouldn't go together because so, the early church were pacifists. It was, that was one thing that they were universal about was pacifism. Yeah. Jesus was a pacifist. If you read the early church writings prior to Constantine, that's when everything got muddied up when, when Constantine got involved and made Christianity legal. Right. So Prior to that, if you read any of the writings, like when Tertullian said, when Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed every Christian. Okay. When G when Peter cut off the Roman soldier's ear, what did Jesus do? He healed the Roman soldier and admonished right. Peter for doing that. When he right, says yeah. he, he encouraged Christians to carry a sword, what was that sword for? Keep reading. There's a reason why he said buy a sword. It was not to go cut a Roman soldier's ear off. Now, I understand the self-defense argument. I get it. It's in our nature to want to defend ourselves. But at the same time, we're not supposed to harm each other, somebody else in the process. I mean, the, the early church was very pacifist. This is one argument I get in with, with Christians these days about self-defense and pacifism and stuff. It's And I've, it's one that I've kind of backed off as well. I'm like, just go read the early church. And get back to me. I could share. I could share so many things with them about the writing. Of those. Well, you know, you've already mentioned the Polycarp story, and you've mentioned uh, Tertullian. Which, I mean, it's almost impossible to read the first, the writings of the first three centuries. Like not just the Gospels, right? But like how the first Christians interpreted those Gospels, right? Was anti-state, right? Was pacifist, yeah. You know that that is how they interpreted it, like. Our faithfulness to Jesus is inherently at odds with the Roman right. government and Caesar in particular. They saw it that way. That was the first application, the freshest application. Somehow we've gotten way far away. Well, probably when Caesar said, hey, it's cool to be Christian, you know, with Constantine or whatever, like you mentioned. And that's, you know, generally regarded as the worst moment for the church. But apparently some people think it was the best. There's a lot of things that the early church disagreed on, as we do today, right? Yes. Yes, they did. You're right. One thing they were universal about was there was pacifism and no king but Christ. There was two things right there they were universal about. And this is all the first 400 years prior to Constantine, right? 
Those two things are universal. No king but Christ. Jesus is our king. Caesar is not. That's right. And we will not kill somebody in the process of defending ourselves. You go read Justin the Martyr. I mean, that was there was universal. I've not found one writing among any of these folks prior to Constantine that would suggest anything otherwise. Not one. And nobody's been able to bring any of that to my attention. And I'm pleading with folks to point this out to me. And then I will share you hundreds of writings from the other folks to discount that one thing that you think you can bring up. They don't, they, it's not there. It does not exist. I am, I, I am confident that those writings do not exist. Now you get past Constantine, you're going to find some garbage that does not line up with the teachings of Jesus and the early church. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. So don't, so, so miss me with that. And I get, I get more frustrated with pastors like the one you were talking to the first time than I do with your regular layman or lay woman in the church, because these folks are, teaching this stuff to the congregation. And I have more of a problem with pastors doing that than I do folks is sitting back and listening to it. Yeah. It's saying that our goal is to take hills for Christ. Now I want to be clear. I think there's a way to talk about this. I've, I've been uh, honored and privileged to, to be in, in some of the most unchurched, unreached areas in the world. And I remember one time I was working with a missionary in Northeast India in the Himalayas. And it is generally considered what a lot of missionaries consider the most lost area on the globe as far as the amount of people that live there and the limited access traditionally to the gospel. In fact, there are areas where, as far as we know, in recorded history, no one has gone to share the gospel in these areas. And so we're riding through these mountains, up a mountain, down a mountain, up and down. And he said, hey, let's sing together. And I said, that's pretty weird, man. And he goes, no, it's like it's warfare. He's like, think about it. It's very possible that no one has praised the name of Jesus Christ on this mountain in the history of it being here. So we're going we're gonna to spiritually take territory by just praising his name, by singing praise to the name of Jesus here. And I believe that. I resonate with that. Like you're doing like battle in like the spirit realm, right? Now, conflating that with literally taking that mountain and claiming it for the, the, the state of whatever Christian nation you think you've established is a totally different thing than that, than just saying, no, we're in the spirit realm. We're going to claim this hill for Jesus. So, I, I mean, I couldn't help but think about it. He's talking about taking hills. I knew what he meant, and it wasn't what that missionary meant. You see what I'm saying? So there's a stark difference there. Yeah, that's actually really cool. That's a, that's that's really cool. That's a cool story. That, that I mean, that guy's right. I have a horrible voice, and if he if he'd asked me to sing with him, I don't know how. how... I, I'm not a singer, but it was not about that in that moment, you know. Right, right. No, I know. I was just trying. I was trying to be a stark. <laughs> All right. So the second guy you were talking to, and you mentioned Razorback Nation and whatever you. Eagle fans call bleed green nation or I don't know. Yeah. There's this concept of a nation and people talk about Christian nationalism and be, having a Christian nation. Right? What do you mean by that? Because like we define nations in a lot of different ways, right? It's not merely political. Like it is a group of people with a common uh, ethos or mindset or some common cause. Right. So like, I don't like to do that because it's so broad a term. I like to be specific when I'm saying no, it's anti-state, right? And so I, I like to be specific with that. But once you start unpacking that, people can't nuance that. They, they, they think that a Christian nation must mean control of the state for Christians. And I'm like, no, those never work. They never, never work. I don't want to be condescending, but it's like, pick a moment in history and it'll show you it doesn't work. It's not like it sometimes doesn't work. It never works. Exactly. What, what's the definition of an insanity? Right. Yeah. Doing the same thing over. Yeah. When you say you don't want to be condescending, I'm going to be a little condescending. At what point do we wake up and say, this has not ever worked? Why are we beating our head against the wall trying to make it work? We're just hurting ourselves. Why? At what point? Do, what, what is it going to take for people to wake up and say, this is bullshit. We're not doing this anymore. Bro, I mocked this guy, and I said, I'm trying to expose you. I said, I'm, I, later in the conversation, he said, you're not really giving, you're, you're terrible at arguing. It's like, I'm not arguing with you. I'm exposing you. Yeah. And he didn't have much to say after that. But 
like I. He they actually said make it a like, little easy too. Sometimes they make. Yeah, it he's right. He's right. He said, "Hey, you're not making it very difficult." But I was like, I mockingly said, "So jihad for Jesus, right?" And he agreed. <laughs> he agreed. This man who says he's a Christian agreed with the concept of jihad for Jesus. I said, "No, I was mocking you. That was not for you to agree with." And that guy, no, there's not anybody that I know that, that I've ever talked to that is, is proud of the Crusades. I mean, and it, like it's going back to the early church, they would have not have been proud of the Crusades. I mean, there's nothing about that that is Christian. Nothing. There's nothing about that that says Jesus. But we're at a point now where people think and are saying it out loud, which they're saying it out loud and defending and doubling down on this idea of taking over the state for Christ taking physical territory for Christ, defeating enemy nations, and they mean enemy states, for Christ. I'm like, that is not a thing. But we're in an age now where people are like arming themselves for this, for a new crusade. Do you remember when uh, the, I don't remember if it was the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, all of them maybe, but George Bush used the word crusade and he got blasted. Yes. by the left for using that terminology. I mean, as he should not to say that they were wrong as he should but have been blasted for it. You know, this guy's using the same type of language and you blasted him for it. Well, I mean, you just, you, you exposed him. You didn't, I don't know if you really blasted him, but you exposed him. And like I said, he makes it, he made it pretty easy. That was, that sounds like that was a pretty easy conversation for you on your end because yeah, I mean, I'm just like, at some point you think the guy's going to have some nuance or anything, but you're like, like, I'm just sitting there reading this my screen and going, like, my eyes are bugging out. I'm like, this can't be real. <laughs> it's one of those moments where you're like, just when you think you've heard everything. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> and so, okay, so so let's get back to the point, right? Let's make the main thing the main thing. That's why these conversations about Christian anarchy, as much as that word may repel people, matter. Because you have to understand, there are people that are taking your middle ground, nuanced kind of idea about being a, a, a you know, American Christian to that extreme. Yeah. They're following the logic of what you think to its logical ends. And that is what the ends are. It is the dadgum crusades. Yeah. You know, like that's the end of what you think. So if you don't like that, and I think most people wouldn't, maybe rethink this. Rethink the attitude of your faith and its relationship to the state in the country which you belong. Maybe consider yourself an exile instead of a citizen. Right. Maybe we need to reposture ourselves because this is where people are taking that. And if you think that's bad, if you think that's evil, if you think that's from the devil, then maybe reconsider your posture towards how your faith matters to the state. You know? And, and that's why I, 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 that's why I think these conversations do matter because like every time I will interact on Twitter or in real life or whatever with someone like with someone who I consider thoughtful, who is saying, no, there's a place for Christians to interact, you know, in politics and all this. And when I make some of these points, there is this genuine, like, Hmm, good point. And, and that's what we want. We don't know. We need to rethink this, you know, like maybe voting is a sin. Maybe the way you vote's a sin, you know, maybe taking these sides is blasphemy to what you say you believe in worshiping Christ. Yeah. You know, maybe you sound just like the Israelites when they wanted a king. Maybe you sound just like Constantine. It's, it's like these things. Like people died in opposition to what you freely give away. Does that bother you? My new, my new favorite pushback when we talk about that demanding a king is we don't have kings anymore. We have representatives. We have presidents and prime ministers. I was like, yeah, they just didn't. That's the big lie, though, right? That's the big trick. They made us feel like we're involved in the process. They they tricked us into making us think we have some real say. Listen, I'll give you this story. I, so I, I had a convert, brother. I had a convert. And uh, it's a dear friend of mine. I've known him for many years. And he writes hit Christian songs. Like, seriously, you know his songs. He was in town because he won a Dove Award. So we meet together and he's talking, we're talking and, he, and he's like, man, the last time I saw you, you were telling me about this Christian anarchy thing. He's like, man, I think I'm with you. I think I'm with you. And he's like, I'm honestly, I voted Democrat most of my life. 
He's like, but that I can't. I've been, he lives in California, and he's like, I just I can't, man. It's getting bad out there. And so he said he's talking to a guy at the church that he's employed by. He's like talking about this pro Trump stuff. He's like, how can you do this? And he goes, let me ask you this. He tells he tells this pastor at a big church. Um, I won't. I don't have a problem telling you the church. It's Harvest Fellowship, the big uh, Greg Lowry's big church in Southern California. It's a mega church. And one of the staff people there said who he's talking to. He says. Um, let me ask you honestly, if Jesus was alive today, who do you think he would vote for? And this guy with a straight face says, I honestly believe he'd vote for Donald Trump. And I laughed and laughed. He goes, well, what do you think the answer is? I said, Kings don't vote. (laughs) Think about the absurdity of what you're saying. Kings don't vote. Like, what are you talking? Like, what? He, if you believe he is the king, why would he reduce himself to vote yeah. for a president? Yeah. Kings don't vote. And so that became like a tagline. We, we texted each other, kings don't vote, hashtag kings don't vote. That is awesome. You know what? I think I'm going to make a post about that when we get down here because that is pretty cool. <laughs> Who would Jesus fo- vote for? Kings don't vote. Kings don't I vote. I love that. <laughs> that might be a new hashtag. We can make go viral. That's awesome. <laughs> Before I let you go, I want you to, you said you got a podcast, plug that, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the barbecue joint that you're working at. Yeah. You're not far from me. You're about three and a half hours from me, and I have not made it to Nashville yet, and I mentioned this to you before, that when I get there, I want to come meet you face to face and eat some of that glorious uh, smoked meat that you were always talking about. Yeah, let's do it. So yeah, I'm pitmaster at Shotgun Willie's Barbecue in Nashville. Like I said, we, we've been voted best barbecue in Nashville, and then... um Side hustle, my wife and I run something called Newman Family Barbecue, where we do catering, pre-order, you know, we do like events and things like that. Uh, one of the cool stories is they did a, a vote for people uh, to vote for the best barbecue in Middle Tennessee. And Newman Family Barbecue was in the contest with Shotgun Willies. And Newman Family Barbecue knocked out like all these like big joints, like Martin's, which has a big joint downtown and all this. And so I made the finals against Shotgun Willie. <laughs> and I'm like, I make the barbecue at both those places. <laughs> it was just kind of like this whole interesting thing. So I'm like, man, I guess, you know, based on this vote, I'm the best pit master in Nashville, which is, you know, I don't know how you quantify that stuff. But based on this contest, I am, <laughs> you know. So anyway, yeah, man, that's what I do. I believe I want to in the contemplative life. And uh, barbecue is conducive to that. You spend a lot of time by yourself, a lot of time thinking. Um, so, you know, I, I really appreciate that. So if anyone's in Nashville, definitely hit me up. I think the best place is to follow on Instagram, Newman family BBQ. That's where we've interacted. And so anybody listening can do that. And, uh, you mentioned my podcast, we've been on hiatus, but we just, uh, had a meeting about starting back up. We're joining a podcast network, um, of predominantly like ex-evangelical type stuff, which is kind of like, wow, we're probably going to be the most conservative dudes on here. But um, my podcast is called Catacomb Podcast. We've put four seasons in and you can check it out wherever you listen to podcasts, Catacomb Podcast. We talk mostly that podcast is about spiritual cynicism, but not just sitting there railing on what we don't like. But we try to end every episode coming up with some sort of solution some sort of middle ground some sort of place where we can land and not be bitter or resentful towards whatever's going on and um if you uh you know i i think there's plenty of podcasts where people rail about what's wrong with christianity and we acknowledge that but we also try to land on a place where well, what are we doing going forward so yeah check that out catacomb podcast and then follow me personally follow my family on newman family bbq if you're in nashville come to shotgun willies or message me in enough time, we can arrange for me to make barbecue for you personally, because that's a part of what I do is when people come visit, um, I cater. So definitely when I when I do finally make that trip to Nashville, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hit you up and I'm going to come eat some of that food and we can sit down and have a beer and talk about some no king but Christ and come up, maybe come up with some some, some solutions. And, you know, that's one of the things we get quite a bit. So what's your solution? We need to talk about it. I think the, the best way to start is to focus to re to, to refocus on Jesus. And I think it's going to lead us where we need to go. And I think the solutions will come with that. And if we can just refocus on Jesus, I think we'll be just fine. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. All right, buddy. 
keep doing what you're doing and keep uh, spreading that message, buddy. And I will talk to you soon. I appreciate it. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about the Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.